Well, good morning. Good to see everyone here this morning. Welcome so many of our visitors. We're glad to have you with us. Many of you have come from far and wide to be with us, and we're thankful for that. You're our honored guest. This morning's lesson is entitled, Manly Saints. Taking our text from 1 Corinthians 6, 16, 13 to 14. As I was looking for pictures that had to do with manliness, I came across this one, and I thought, what is more manly than to be reminded of David as a youth standing between sheep, between a bear and a lion, and a bear and a lion. And later on, I want you to keep this picture in mind for later on, we're going to reference and uh, read a short passage in 1 Samuel 17 that this has everything to do with. But as I was trying to find the, the picture that kind of depicted manly saints that we're going to read about in, six, in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, I couldn't help but think of David as I was putting this together. And so I want you to keep this picture in mind as, as we go through, especially later on when we reference 1 Samuel 17. You know, once a person decides to be a Christian and obeys the gospel, that's when real responsibility begins. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14, I know this is Old Testament, but I want you to see what Solomon said was the whole duty of man. Some of the responsibilities that we have as Christians still follow in line as we're going to see in the New Testament as these things are repeated over and over again, that once we become a Christian, we have responsibility. But for all people, there is a duty of man for all people to come to know God and obey Him. That is what God expects of all people. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14, I'm reading from the King James. It says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. I want you to think of the New King James says this is man's all, because that is pretty much the literal translation here. The whole duty of man or man's all, it's saying that's what we were created for. That's what we're made for, is to fear God and to keep His commandments. That's everything for us. Then it says in verse 14, the reason that we are to fear God and keep His commandments is here in verse 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now we can go and we can look in 2 Corinthians 5.10 and see the same thing played out. All men, doesn't matter that how, how influential you were, how rich, how poor, all men will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And all men, therefore, will, give, will be recompensed for what they have done in the body, whether good or bad. Solomon here is making sure to let everyone know whether you think you got away with it or not. God knows. And He's going to bring it to light. And you are going to be judged by those things. In John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And then again in chapter 15 and verse 14, He says, Right after verse 13, when he says, Greater love has no man than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. He says in verse 14, You are my friends. If, there's that small conditional word, If you keep my commandments. He says, If you love me. There are so many people today that claim they love Jesus. They know Jesus. But it's evident in their lives whether that's truly so. Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He says, you're my friends if you keep my commandments. And in, in conclusion to his letter to the Corinthian saints, Paul states five duties of all saints. In these two short passages, I want you to see what Paul says. He says, be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. These are the five things we're going to be focused on this morning. As we look at what Paul, as he was wrapping up his letter to the Corinthian saints, after all the good and bad things he had to say to them, some of the things that were not pleasant, the things that he had to correct, he's ending his letter on a note of saying they need to stand up, they need to be strong, they need to stand firm in the faith, and whatever they do, let it be done in love. All men have a duty to obey God, but once they do, that's where the true responsibility, that's where the true duty begins to God. The first thing he says there in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. He says, be alert. I'm reading from the New King James, it'll say, watch. God's people have always been called upon to watch. This is consistent with any time period. If you go back to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 3 and verse 17, God said of Ezekiel that he set him as a watchman over his people. Now Ezekiel is prophesying to his people, they've already been the beginning punishment that God promised that they would go into exile for 70 years to Babylon. Ezekiel is one of those swept away with the people early on and settled in Babylon. 
So while Jeremiah is in Jerusalem preaching and prophesying, Ezekiel's with the exiles in Babylon, and Daniel is in the capital with the king. These three men were prophesying at the same time. And God says to Ezekiel, now the punishment's already began. So notice what he's saying, the importance there. You have messed up. You have sinned. 2 Chronicles 36, 16 says, Till there was no remedy left. They were swept away in exile. But even the people in exile still had an expectation to obey God. And God says of Ezekiel, He set him as a watchman over the people. And that he would be held accountable if he did not give warning to the people. If he did not tell them the things that God said for him to say. And even if he did and the people didn't listen, that was on them. But if he didn't warn, it was on him. That's what a watch, That's the responsibility that falls on a watchman, isn't it? That a watchman, if they do not warn of the danger, they could be branded a traitor. That's why it was so important in the ancient world. That's why there were stiff punishments for the watchman that fell asleep at his post. God says of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 3.17, you are a watchman. God's people have always been called upon to watch. Here, Paul says to the Corinthian saints, be on the alert. That means to watch. Saints are called to watch for or to be alert to many things. Elders are to watch for our souls in Hebrews 13, 17. We find that we're to watch for those that we might teach. John 4, 35 and Colossians 4, 2 through 4. We're called to watch for and be ready to resist Satan. That means we can't just go through life with our blinders on. We're to watch for those things that take place. We're to see and recognize the temptations in our own lives. And be able to resist Him. 1 Peter 5, 8-9 says when we stand firm in our faith, we can resist Him. That's why the next part there, after being alert, we're to stand firm in our faith. This certainly applies when resisting Satan. James chapter 4, verse 7 says, resist Him and He will flee from you. And we're told to watch for false teachers. This is certainly a job of the elders, but it's also a job for all saints. In 2 Timothy 4, 3-5, Timothy Called upon as the preacher there in Ephesus. He was told he's to watch out for false doctrine and be ready to combat it. 1 John 4, 1. The address to all saints. Or to be able to test the spirits and see if they are from God. And Jude 3. We are to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all handed down to the saints. We are to watch, be on the alert for false teaching. And we need to watch our own behavior. James 1, 19. It says we need to watch for our own temperament, our speech, and our actions. Philippians 1.27 says we need to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel which we've been called. And we must, be walk, we must be ready for Christ's second coming. That requires us to be alert and to watch for it. In 1 Thessalonians 5.6, he points out that we're not of the night, we are of the day. And so that last day ought not overcome us. In Mark 13... 35 to 37, this is a passage I wanted us to turn to. If you look in verse 33, I have 35 through 37 on the slide behind me, but if you back, if you're going to read it with me, back up to verse 33 with me. And he says, Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man away on a journey, who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. Jesus was telling his disciples to watch and be ready for his coming. We're told that over and over throughout the scriptures, this is a consistent theme that Jesus laid down, that we be watchful, that we be alert for all these other things we talked about, but that be ready for his second coming. 2 Peter 3, 11 to 12. After Peter talks about how the world is going to be burned up in that last day. He says, And you, knowing these things are going to take place, what sort of people ought you to be but living in holiness and godliness, looking for and hastening the day of the Lord, which will come like a thief in the night. We need to be watchful and ready. No matter what time period we look at, our lives are to be spent on the alert. God's people have always been called to be watchful. And so it should come as no surprise as Jesus lays down the groundwork for the gospel that we are to be watchful for his second return. And as we read through these scriptures, Paul's able to exhort the Corinthians at the end of his letter, be on the alert. 
our lives are be spent on the earth. That we might watch out for souls and that we might hasten for the day of the Lord. The next thing there in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 is stand firm in the faith. In Ephesians 10, 6, 10 through 14, I want to thank Joel for the scripture reading this morning. And I said he turned there with me to Ephesians chapter 10. Ephesians chapter 10. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he says, stand firm in the faith. But then we see as we look in Ephesians chapter 6, that saints must learn to take a stand for the truth of the gospel. Notice what he says in verses 10 through 11. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. <coughs> you notice here as Paul's going to go through these first couple passages that before he even begins to describe the armor, his whole point in putting on these pieces of the spiritual armor is that the saint might stand firm, that he might stand strong, that he might stand against the schemes of the devil, and when the smoke clears, so to speak, be found standing. So in verses 10 to 11, saints must learn to take a stand for the gospel of the truth. And look with me in verses 13 to 14. Starting in verse 12, he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, Therefore, he's saying, our battle is not against flesh and blood. So many people throughout time have got this wrong. People today, when you talk about Christianity, they still, whether it's in person or online, and, and whatever the debate comes up, it always comes up, well, what about the Crusades when Christians did all? No, they weren't Christians. Those were Catholics, and there's a difference. The Lord's Church was never militant in a physical sense. If it was, it was no longer the Lord's church. It stepped over its bounds. It spells it out here and in several other places. But Paul says our battle is not flesh and blood. We're not to pick up physical arms. This is a spiritual battle. And we do so against these, he says, against rulers, against powers, against the world forces of this darkness. Verse 13, therefore, take up the full armor of God so you'll be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything, to stand firm. And then as he gives the pieces of the armor, verse 14, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The armor of God is given that saints might stand. That's what it's given for. So that saints might stand. In 1 John 5, 4, it tells us that our faith has overcome the world. That we sing a hymn, faith is the victory. That faith is only our victory when we stand behind it. When we put that shield in front of us. When we extinguish the fiery darts of Satan. We must know that the source of our strength is not in our might. It's not in the might of even the, whatever physical or whatever uh, image we have of us in this full armor of God. Our might is not within ourselves. We need to recognize that this strength to stand is found in Christ. In Philippians chapter 4, 1 and verse 13. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. And in verse 13, he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. There's a direct correlation between standing firm in the faith and relying on Christ. Because He is our strength. He's what's going to see us through that battle. It is in Christ and His strength alone and His might that we can be found standing when the smoke clears. Christians must stand up for the truth. Jude 3 says, contend earnestly for the faith. We've talked about it many times before, that word contend and earnestly, that, that they go both hand in hand. That contend is a word that is used of, of a wrestling. It was a, it was a word used of hand-to-hand -hand combat. And it was a word that was associated with the Olympic Games, but it was also a word that was used in military training uh, phraseology that the Greeks had. This was a word for hand-to-hand -hand combat. When he says contend earnestly, he's talking about a drag-out brawl. He says contend earnestly for the faith. That requires one to stand up, be accounted, and stand firm in their faith. When he says contend earnestly for it, the shield of faith that we just read about in Ephesians 6 and verse 16 will only work if we stand firm and use. That means fight with it. 
And then the third part of 1 Corinthians 16, 13, where I took the title from, is he says, act like men. The New King James renders this, be brave. But I want you to look at the Greek word for this. And as I was looking for pictures that depicted manliness, I typed in Google just manly. And this came up, and I loved it. It says, sawdust? You mean man glitter? It doesn't get more manly than that. And then I found this guy just knock out, drag out, brawl with a bear. It's shirts and tatters, but it looks like he's got the upper hand. But this word means act like men. The Greek word here in Strong's, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, the Strong's Dictionary is 407, and it's andrid zamahi. It means to act manly, be a man. The King James renders it, quit like men. Now that's not quit like in the way we use it today, where you just quit and leave something. When the King James renders it, quit like men, that means to act like men. Another way that is rendered in the Old English is a quit like men. It means to act like men, just as the Greek word means, to act manly, to be a man. In contrast to being weak or immature, one must be brave and be manly. You know, when I typed in manly, one of the very first pictures that popped up was this one. And I said, it doesn't get more manly than this. Abraham Lincoln, full trench coat, top hat, riding a bear as the, the nation's flag is his saddle, waving an AR-15 about, holding proudly the proclamation, or the Emancipation Proclamation. That was one of the first pictures that came up when I typed in manly and I had to use it. Manliness is in contrast to one being weak or immature. It means to be brave, to be manly. And I would say it's in contrast to the weak nature portrayal in popular culture of men today. All saints must be brave, to act like men, and to be manly. But let's not use the way they are depicted today to decide what is manly. Otherwise, we'd be in trouble. In the last few decades, men have been made to feel somewhat ashamed for being manly. In popular culture, masculine men are portrayed as the Neanderthals, the brutes, they're dim-witted. No, starting around the 1990s, there was a phrase that was going around saying, get in touch with your feminine side. All of us that grew up through the 90s, you remember that? It might have been a phrase that was earlier on, but it really became popular in the 90s. It was slogans, it was on bumper stickers, it was on billboards, it was almost in every commercial, it was in TV shows galore. Get in touch with your feminine side. And it was said in a manner of different ways. But what that phrase meant was that it was okay for men to show their emotions. Men might have always been able to show their emotions before, but what they're saying is, it's no longer manly to just hold it all in. Now you need to just let it out. I remember one TV show in particular showed this, uh, had an actor that was known for being in these action roles. And they had him on this sitcom that throughout the entire sitcom, he's almost in just weeping in tears because some girl helped him get in touch with his feminine side. And it was showing, you can cry, it's okay, you can show emotions. And while there's nothing inherently wrong with that, the push, the agenda there, was to show men something more than, less than manly. It was to show them as soft. Popular culture depicted men as being more feminine, with even some enjoying typically female pastimes. Shopping, fashion, etc., lotions. In fact, a new phrase was coined in 1994. The word metrosexual. Webster, this became so popular, it's, it's in almost any dictionary you pick up now. Webster says a usually urban heterosexual male given to enhancing his personal appearance by fastidious grooming, beauty treatments, and fashionable clothes. The Cambridge English Dictionary says, it gives that same, that same uh, explanation that Webster's does, but then it goes on to say that men usually will spend lots of money to achieve these things. Now, there's nothing sinful for a man to be well-groomed. There's nothing sinful for a man to enjoy shopping or even to enjoy fat wearing fashion. But again, this agenda, this push, was to depict men in popular culture as something less than men. In fact, the guy that coined this term, his name is Mark Simpson. He coined the term in 1994, metrosexual. And he said it was masculinity moisturized. And that certainly became very popular throughout the 90s. In fact, many masculine men were constantly depicted in popular culture as the Neanderthals, the dim-witted brutes, the ones that had to be cultured, the ones that had to be shown their feminine side so they could be more in touch with the modern times. Now, there has been a slight shift from that recently. I think after 20 years, people have 
got tired of that depiction and they want something more manly. And so there has been a slight shift from that in recent times. In fact, other names are starting to be given. The same guy that coined this phrase has coined a different phrase, and I don't want to even say it here. It's not a very good phrase, the next one that he coined, but it describes a manly person, but with different tendencies. Anyhow, if you want to look it up, look up Mark Simpson, you'll find it. In the 1990s, it spawned marketing of a whole new array of hygiene products aimed at men. Aside from deodorants and colognes that had, always, that had been around for a long time, but the 90s spawned a whole marketing level of, on a whole new level, skincare products for men. Before the 90s, that was unheard of. And if it was, it was normally the upper end, the upper crust. But now all of a sudden, there was this push to get these things in the hands of everyone. And now again, there's nothing wrong with men that want to be moisturized. There's nothing inherently sinful with that. But there was an agenda here. There was a push to push men into enjoying and be seen right alongside these feminine activities that were typically female. These were things to give, put a push that men didn't have to be manly. They could be soft. They could be a little more feminine. So that's why I say, when we talk about act like men, it's not good to look in our society today and see how men are depicted to know how to act like men. This call to act like men is not our society's typical depiction. It says God created man in his image in Genesis 1, 26-27. He created him to be brave, to take a stand, ready for action. Look in 1 Peter 1, verse 13. In 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 13. <clears throat> He says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. One of the literal ways to read that is to gird your minds for action. Gird the loins of your mind for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Some translations read that as ready for action. Make your minds ready for action. In Ephesians 4 and verse 14. We're told that we're to no longer be children, carried by every wind of doctrine. We need to know what it means to take a stand. When we look through the scriptures and see how God depicts something that is manly, a real man is one that loves God, chooses to serve Him above all else, no matter what the consequences. And a man knows what the duty and responsibilities are to God, to his family, and, and the Israelite nation, it was to their nation. Men were, men were willing to make the sacrifices necessary for God, for their families, and for their country. That's what being a man means. When we look throughout the scriptures, there's no one place I can look that God says this is what it means to be a man. We see in the garden, God set man to work to feed his family because of the sin that had took place there in Genesis 3. And one of the, one of the punishments that was handed to men was they had to work and by the, their hands, by the sweat of their brow, they would eat. And throughout time, as we, see, <coughs> as we see history play out, it was men that stood up with that role, that responsibility, and did what they were expected to do by God. And that God said they were pleasing in His sight. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 12, we're to live as lights. Titus says we're to live, or Paul says to Titus, we're to live sensibly, righteously, and godly. We're to, deny unworld, un, un, we're to deny ungodliness. We're to deny worldly desires. These things that would take us away from God. That distract us from our mission. We are to live sensibly, righteously, and godly. And again, Philippians 1.27 talks about walking in a manner worthy of the gospel. In Philippians 2.15, he says that you can be above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. You can be lights unto the world. And I want you to think about what that takes that takes strength and courage to stand out. It takes strength and courage to say, I'm different from the world. Because the world watches. Those in the world, they take note of who are different, who stand out from them. And it's not always pleasant. They will scoff and they will mock. But we're told to act like men. That means to be brave, to be courageous, ready for action, ready to take a stand. And that means to be a light into the, world, into the dark world around us. And that brings us back full circle to what we read in Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. Where he says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Again, it's not our own. It is his. 
Be strong in the Lord, in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God, so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so you'll be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. And the next passage, again, starts out saying, stand firm three times. From verses 10 to 14, Christians are told to stand firm. What he's saying is when the smoke clears, Christians are to be seen standing firm. That means to face it and defeat it, not be knocked down by it, not be overcome by it. The life of a saint requires bravery and courage to weather life storms and the temptations that come with it. And the very next thing he says, after saying act like men, he says be strong. God has always expected his people to be strong. Standing up for him against all odds. In Joshua 1, 6-9. Turn with me to Joshua. In Joshua chapter 1. <clears throat> Moses has died. And he's passed the mantle of leadership over to Joshua. It, is, it falls to Joshua now to bring the people of Israel. After coming out of Egypt. After wandering the desert for 40 years. That punishment might come on those that were too cowardly to enter into the land. If you remember, the twelve spies were sent in and they came back. Ten of them said, we're grasshoppers in our own sight. We can't do it. Well, Joshua and Caleb said, let's take it. It was beautiful. It was everything God said it would be. Let's take it. But the people went with the ten. And so God promised that those two, Joshua and Caleb, out of that whole host that came out of Egypt, out of the adults, Joshua and Caleb would enter the land. And so now Joshua has been promoted as leader in Moses' stead. And he is charged with taking this great people and moving them into the promised land that God promised Abraham back in Genesis 12 and verse 3. Becky and I were talking about this in context of something else and realized that it had been almost 600 years by the time Joshua is going to cross the Jordan River into Canaan since the time the promise was made to Abraham in Genesis 12. And so this is a huge task. This is a huge deal to fall on Joshua. And notice what God says to him, and starting in verse 6. He says, Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. So you may be careful to do all according to what is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God is saying, you're about to take them into this land. that I promised their forefathers they would inherit. It falls on you. But as long as you do all that I commanded you to do, as long as you make the word of God, the law of Moses, part of your daily life, you meditate on it day and night. He says, if you're careful to do all that I have commanded you to do, he said, and you're brave, and you're very courageous. He says, there's nothing for you to fear. He says, I will be with you. And the very first task, it's no coincidence that the very first thing they come against is fortified Jericho. That archaeology has determined that the walls were about 14 feet thick. That two chariots could race abreast around the top. And that's the first thing these nomadic people from the desert come up, again, come up against. And why God says to him, you do what I tell you to do, and those walls will come down. They didn't need siege engines. Joshua had to be brave, he had to be strong, and he had to be courageous. Joshua was told over and over in that short passage we read, from God telling him, be strong and be courageous for what's at hand. And then over in 1 Chronicles 28, one of my favorite passages in thinking about messages that a father can pass down to his son. It's found here in 1 Chronicles 28, 9 and verse 20. <clears throat> We're going to read actually verses 9 and 10. David is dying. And he has chosen his son Solomon to reign in his stead. And he's got some words of wisdom he wants to impart to Solomon. And so he says to him in verse 9, As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father. That is first and foremost. That is what every father ought to pass down to his children. Know the God of your father. He says, And serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind, 
Again, remember what God told Joshua? As long as you know me, as long as you know my law and you keep it and you're careful to do all that is commanded in it, you will have nothing to fear. David is saying the same thing to Solomon. Know the God of your father. Serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will let you find it. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be courageous and act. And then over in verse 20. Then David said to his son Solomon, Be strong and courageous and act. See that being strong and courageous isn't just a feeling we get to hold inside. There's action. He says, Be strong and courageous and act. Do not fear nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you till all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. He says, no matter how difficult it is ahead for you, Solomon, you be strong, you be courageous, and you act. And God, my God, will be with you. Here's the important part of that to me. One of the important things to understand is who this is coming from. David tells Solomon to be strong, to be courageous, and act. I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I told you to keep that picture at the very beginning in mind. I wasn't going to put it in here again. But in 1 Samuel chapter 17, David as a youth, now he's been anointed king back in chapter 16, but he comes, into the, he comes to this encampment of the Israelite army, and he sees that there's the Israelites on one side of the mountain, and then there's the Philistines on another, and in the valley between them both, Goliath, this giant from Gath, comes in, and he taunts the armies of God. And for 40 days, not a champion would go and face him. And David finds that out, and it just hurt him inside his soul. And so he goes before King Saul. And Saul is looking at a boy. He's got grown men that are fully armed and trained. And here's a boy standing before him. Why on earth did this king send a boy to do what should have been a man's job? I want you to see what David says to him that changed his mind. In 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 34. But David said to Saul, because Saul reminds him, you're, you're a child, and this guy, this nine-foot giant, has been a warrior since his youth. He's well-trained, he's well-armed. Verse 34, but David said to Saul, your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he's taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he'll deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, may the Lord be with you. What else could he say after that? So, David, having done all these things, in his later years telling Solomon to be strong, to be courageous, David was a man that knew what needed to be done. And he had always lived his life doing it. As a shepherd, he took his job seriously. But he did not run from the lion or the bear and say, well, it's just sheep. It's not worth my life. No, nope. he put his life between the lamb and the lion and the bear. Is it any wonder then that God described him, even at a young age, to Saul as the man after his own heart and the man who is his neighbor who is better than him and that he would be the shepherd of his people because David would sacrifice anything to get the job done. And here he's telling Solomon, be strong, be courageous, and act. He didn't just, these weren't just pretty words from a dying king. These are words from a man that lived his life according to those words. And he's imparting them to his son. God has always expected his people to be strong, to stand up for him against all odds, to be courageous and to act. Elders, deacons, preachers, and all members must be strong. Ephesians 6.10, over and over in this passage, we're told to stand firm. Christianity is for the struggle. In Hebrews 10, 35-39, the Hebrew writer is telling his audience they had their property seized. They were imprisoned for being Christians. He says in verse 35, Now is not the time to throw away your confidence. He says, God has no pleasure in the soul that shrinks back to destruction. He says, But we are not of those that shrink back to destruction, 
for those through our faith the preserving of our souls. And that reminds me of this passage in 1 Corinthians 6, 16, 13. To be manly. Paul told Timothy to be strong in Christ, to teach others and endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 3. And it takes strength. It takes courage to walk the path of righteousness. And it takes strength and courage to fulfill our duties before God. I want you to look with me in Hebrews chapter 12. I think about, as we read Hebrews chapter 12, 12 to 13, and we think about Jesus' words back in Matthew 7, as he describes the narrow road and the broad road. The broad road is where the majority of people are. That's where the popular people are. That's the party road. Everybody's on the, the broad road. But he, gives, he takes away any mystery that it's in might have. No matter how enticing, no matter how luxurious it might look, it leads to destruction. He says there's a narrow road. And there's few that find it. And it will take courage and it will take strength to be able to stay on that narrow road. Because there's going to be so many exits that lead back to that broad road. But notice what is said here in Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 12. He says, Therefore strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. And make straight paths for your feet. See what he's saying? He's saying it's easy to stumble. It's easy to fall. It's easy to become weak in the knees because of the things that we might have to face. He says you strengthen those knees and you make straight the paths for your feet. Don't go to those exits to the broad road. Stay on the narrow. He says make straight paths for your feet. He says so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. It takes being strong and courageous to walk the path of righteousness. And that might be why it says only few will find it. Because it takes that strength of, and courage of heart, and that means conviction. Ready to stand through the trials of life. And to see it through to the end, that no matter what happens, when the smoke clears, we'll be seen standing firm. Saints must be strong and courageous to faithfully serve the Lord. And finally, in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, he says, Let all that you do be done in love. Love should be our motive in all that we do. 1 Corinthians 13, 1-3, Paul says, No matter what I do, I can have all these wonderful things. I can, have, I can do all these wonderful things. But if I don't have love, it's vain. It's like a banging symbol. It's, it's meaningless. It's nothing. Our motivation ought to be done from love. Our love to God is to be seen in our obedience. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. 1 John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. We must have the right love. The pleasures of life often keep saints from loving God the way that they should. We see from that narrow road we're on, we see the, the broad road and how fun it looks. We see the enticements and the pleasures. If it wasn't pleasurable, if it wasn't fun, it wouldn't be a temptation. And so the narrow road we're walking, we seem to do, be doing this. And that's why the Hebrew writer says, make straight the path for your feet. Don't we veer to the left. Don't veer to the right. Don't take those exits that will lead to destruction. No, we must have the right love. Pleasures of life often keep saints from loving God the way they should. 2 Timothy 3, 1-5 describes people who are be lovers of self. And then this long list of all these terrible things that come from that type of selfishness. 1 John 2, 15-17 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world because they are perishing. But the one that does the will of God will live forever. Saints know love is hard. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44-46 that we must even love our enemies. This runs counterintuitive to everything in our being, is it, does it not? We're not trained from an early age to love our enemies. That doesn't come naturally. But yet Jesus said we're to be different. Even in the way we talk and act towards other people that are hostile towards us. We're to love our enemies. Jesus exemplified that on the cross when he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Then a disciple, we see Stephen in Acts chapter 7, as he's being stoned to death. Not a pleasant way to go. And he says, forgive them. They know not what they do. Would those words be on our lips? The situation was ours? I don't know. Jesus says we're to love our enemies. We know that love is tough. But our actions will demonstrate our love in all that we do. 1 John 3, 18. Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. 1 Peter 4, 8 says we must... Love one another and bear one another's burdens. That often requires us to put aside our pride. 
Put aside the, the light of attention off ourselves to help someone else out. To be there for them. We must speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15 2 Timothy 2, 24-26, this is the reason that correction is given that might save a soul from hell. is out of love. We're to love those that are in the snare of the devil. Not mock, not scoff. But see, they're in need. They need help the same way we needed the gospel. And be willing to impart it. That's why it says we need to be able to teach. To snatch them from the snare of the devil. We must have love for the truth. That's a problem for many people. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 says there were some people that did not have a love for the truth to be saved. James 1.21 says in humility we ought to receive the word that can save souls. Love is our motive for serving God and loving our fellow men. As we conclude, we need to strive to live our lives as saints ought to live. Ephesians 5.3-4 says there's a proper way for saints to behave. And we're to walk in such a manner. We're to walk as is fitting for saints, practicing these things in our lives will help us grow spiritually. We'll be the kind of example to others that God wants us to be. Matthew 5.16 and Philippians 2.15 both talk about uh, saints need to be lights into the darkness around them. I'm going to exhort us in the same way Paul ended his letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 16. And that is be manly saints. Be alert. Stand firm. Be strong and courageous. And let all that we do come from love. Let that be our motivation to serve God, to serve our families, to serve one another. If you're not a Christian this morning, you need to be, to repent and be baptized. You must first obey God before you can be examples to others. Just as God told Joshua, know my word, make it yours, and then you have no reason to fear, I will be with you. Just as David told Solomon, know the God of your father. Serve Him with a whole and willing heart. And it will be well with you. You won't have any reason to fear. First obey God. Then be an example to others. And if you're a Christian this morning in error, now's the time for correction. Now's the time not to wait. Not to say one day. No one's to say, I have sinned. I need to make it right with God. That's the attitude David had. And that's why he was called a man after God's own heart. Because even when David slipped and made, and made mistakes, and he made some big mistakes... David had the heart to say, I have sinned against the Lord. And he would make correction. Have that same heart, that willing mind to be able to get past pride and say, I have messed up. Repent and be renewed. And if we can assist you in any of these things this morning, if, you're stand, if you stand in need of the invitation of Christ in any way, come forward, let it be known now while we stand and while we sing.